Okay, so with that background about the role of ethno-fractionalization in providing public goods and providing access to kind of greater society as a whole, uh, what I want to talk about for this final section is the institutional legacies that we have from slavery and why it's become such an intractable problem for granting broader access to um, institutions and to public goods and to society as a whole um, to huge portions of society. Um, so... The issue with slavery here, where it was formally abolished in 1865 um, on June 19th when the, the last groups of slaves heard about um, their, um, or 1863 when the last groups of slaves heard about their um, emancipation, um, and then formally abolished with the, with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, um, where black Americans were given full constitutional rights on paper, um, what's ended up happening is that um, the, the legacy of slavery, even though it's been ended for more than 100 years, it is um, the institutions and the history of this has created um, what some scholars have called the most intractable and longest lasting aspect of American ethnofractionalization. Um, and it is an area in economics and in public policy where the government has actually been very detrimental. Um, to um, granting kind of a broader, broader access to rights. And the reason why is because of that cycle we talked about in the first section here, um, where people in power shape the rules that keep them in power and keep them gaining access to more power and to more uh, privilege and to more money. And so getting that to reverse, to expand to more people, is really, really difficult um, and um, has led to um, decades and decades of unequal access. So before we talk about kind of how to, how, how lots of economists and, and legal scholars have been looking at how to fix these institutional legacies of, slav of slavery and white supremacy, um, one thing we need to talk about is one last economic model. Um, that comes from um, Economy, Society, and Public Policy. I didn't have you read this chapter, um, mostly because it's a fairly straightforward model. Um, and the fun thing about this model is there's no math, there's no lines even. It's this picture here, which is a bathtub. Um, and the nice thing about this bathtub model is it helps us um, see the difference between assets and income. Um, and this is important when we look at public policies that have been invented to reduce ethno-fractionalization and to increase opportunities for black Americans um, at gaining better access to society. Um, because those um, policies have targeted specific parts of this bathtub model here. So here we have, there's a difference between wealth, which is all of the money or kind of the assets that you have stored up in this bathtub here. And so over time, um, you have income. So if you look at the shower head, it's shooting stuff into this bathtub here. Um, your income you accumulates over time. If you don't spend it, it's just going to keep rising. Um, you do have to spend it, though. And so that's this consumption. So you have to spend money on rent and groceries and other things. Um, over time, it will start depreciating in value because of inflation. And so it kind of evaporates. Um, so we, we don't care so much about these two, uh, the depreciation consumption. What we care most about in this model is this idea of wealth and income. And the, the interesting thing about this is you can actually get more income if, if the system is set up like it is in this picture. Your wealth goes out, but then it will actually lead to more income. If it's just trickling out, you're not going to get a lot of, um, um, of income coming in here. And so the difference is, like, if you're thinking about... Um, even with like taxation. Um, income tax targets this part right here, targets the money that you're getting and it kind of diverts some of that stream out towards the government. That's the whole purpose of an income tax. Wealth taxes are very, very limited in the United States, in part because um, the political classes have not really wanted them um, because they're also in charge. When Elizabeth Warren was running for president earlier in 2020, one of her policy points was to institute a wealth tax, which would not target people like Bill Gates's annual income um, because they can reduce their annual income to like nothing. They have a huge um, bathtub full of, of wealth and money there. Um, and so if we're just using income taxes to target their income, that can just go away. Um, but wealth taxes are designed to um, kind of take from this, this larger bathtub full of, of assets. Um, the other thing you can do beyond taxation is if you have a large reserve of wealth, um, that smooths out your, um, 
your consumption. It makes it so that if you're facing hard times, if you get laid off from your job, you can rely on your wealth tub here um, to get you through. You can continue to pay rent. You can continue to pay your mortgage until you find a new job. Um, even if it's not your own wealth, if you have access to um, family wealth, you can borrow from your parents, borrow from your uncles or your aunts or your grandparents. Um, that's basically wealth that you can draw on um, to smooth out your consumption and smooth out your spending and make life um, a lot easier than if you have no wealth at all and you're living purely paycheck to paycheck and you sprain your ankle and you don't have insurance and then suddenly everything falls apart and um, medical bankruptcy happens and it's awful. And so, um, yeah, so what we want to do when we're talking about this, this idea of public policy fixing kind of this, this legacy of slavery that we have, um, we need to consider this difference between assets, which is the wealth part here, the tub, all the stuff you have in reserve, and income, which is the stuff that's coming into your wealth here. Um, and so there's a, there's a good reason we care about this because if you target public policy at one of these, um, it's not going to be as effective as targeting it as another one. And we'll figure out which one it is in just a minute here. Um, and so this is actually, this is not a new idea. Um, uh, Martin Luther King in 1967, you watched his interview um, and, or a section of his interview on NBC um, for the readings for today. And his, his main point in that interview is that um, you can't tell somebody to pull themselves, pull themselves up by their own bootstraps if they don't have bootstraps. Um, if we go back to the bathtub model, you can't tell somebody to just rely on their wealth and, and start their own business and go find a new job if they have no assets to rely on in the first place. Um, this wealth bathtub here is essentially the bootstraps that Martin Luther King talks about here. Um, and so you like it's the boots that uh, like if you're a bootless man, you don't have a tub full of anything. Um, and so if you're targeting um, public policy at um, helping boost income, that's helpful because it'll start building up wealth, but it's going to drain pretty quick. If you invent public policy that is designed to boost assets and the initial endowment of wealth that you have, then you can draw on that and you can um, kind of rely on that more and smooth out your consumption, um, have less stress about paying rent and about paying mortgages and other things because you have this reserve of resources to rely on, um, which is what uh, Martin Luther King here was getting at with, with this quote here. Um, and so public policy around um, kind of fixing the economic um, inequalities that stem from, from slavery have focused primarily on this difference between assets and income. Um, and so initially in the, during the Civil War, um, there was this rallying cry um, to um, give all freed slaves 40 acres and a mule. And the whole purpose of this 40 acres and a mule promise was to essentially take assets from the, the white ruling classes in the South and transfer assets to freed slaves so that they would have essentially a pre-filled bathtub that they could start working with. And then, um, then income can come into it, but they have that reserve of funds, that reserve of land, um, reserve of animals they can start working with. Um, and so this was actually the, the union's official policy towards freed slaves. Um, President Lincoln established what was called the Freedmen's Bureau help, with help from William Tecumseh Sherman, who invaded Atlanta, um, where they invented a whole cabinet level office in the federal government to um, help distribute 40 acres and a mule and general asset redistribution to freed slaves. Um, and so the whole purpose of that was to promote assets and make it so that freed slaves had access to bathtubs, um, metaphorical bathtubs here. The issue, though, is that um, President Lincoln was assassinated, Andrew Johnson came to power as president, and he was a white supremacist, and so he just um, removed the Freedmen's Bureau, canceled the 40 acres and a mule promise, um, and got rid of it. And so as a result, none of that asset transfer happened. Um, and was not great historically. Um, but it wasn't that uh, Andrew Johnson and other presidents were against the transfer of assets to people. Um, they were just against the transfer of assets to black people. Um, at the same time that President Johnson canceled um, the Freedmen's Bureau and the 40 acres and a mule promise, um, there was another giant asset transfer program happening in America simultaneously. 
Um, so right here, this is the homesteading act of 1862, um, which ran from 1862 up until the very early 1900s. Um, and this promised um, people 160 acres somewhere out in the West or the Midwest. Um, so you could move with your family to Minnesota or to the Dakotas or to Nebraska or Iowa and establish a homestead there. If you worked on the land for X number of years, you got that as your family farm. It was designed, again, to promote assets. Um, the whole Little House on the Prairie series, if you ever read that in elementary school, that, was, that happened because of the Homesteading Act. Um, the, the Wilder family moved out to Wisconsin and Minnesota and wherever they were um, because they wanted these 160 acres. They wanted the asset transfer. As a result of this program, more than 80 million acres were distributed to white settlers um, throughout the Midwest. Um, so federal government was totally happy to transfer assets to white families, but not happy to transfer assets to freed black slaves. Um, the other thing about this is that it distributed 180 acres to all of these different families, um, but most of those acres were taken from Native American tribes who had been displaced already from the East Coast, sent to the Midwest, and then the Homesteading Act essentially canceled those treaties, pushed them further into to reservations, and gave that land to the white settlers. And so you can see, again, this is a highly racialized act here, um, both because black slaves were not able or black former slaves were not able to access it and because it displaced existing uh, Native Americans. Um, so not great based on this whole idea of white supremacy and um, promoting assets for specific classes of Americans. Um, the same idea has continued throughout history. Um, following World War II, um, with all of the returning veterans, um, the United States federal government wanted to make it, uh, they wanted to help build up the middle class especially after the ravages of the Great Depression. So they wanted to make it so that these returning veterans could get their own house and so that they could then essentially have assets, um, have kind of a long-term investment. And so um, they created the, the Federal Housing Authority, which gave really cheap loans with good terms um, to returning veterans um, that were highly um, insured and very difficult to default on um, and allowed kind of the early middle class in America to form. Um, and it, again, it was a government transfer of assets to certain classes of Americans. Um, but on not, su not surprisingly, the access to FHA programs and FHA mortgages was incredibly unequal and again, highly racialized. Um, you could not get an FHA loan to move into certain areas in cities. Um, the whole Federal Housing Authority had a system um, where they mapped out which parts of a city were allowed to receive FHA loans. Um, and this is the notion of redlining here. Um, so here's Atlanta um, back in 1938. This is the FHA map of Atlanta. Um, all of these red zones were unable to get favorable FHA loans. All of the yellow zones were okay. All of the blue zones um, were super okay. And you could get really favorable terms if you lived um, or if you bought a house in these areas. And not surprisingly, um, these also mapped heavily onto uh, the racial distribution of the city at the time. Um, and so if you were a black family who wanted to gain access to or to get government support to build up assets and to get a house and to start investing in your own personal real estate, you were unable to do so. Um, you could theoretically go buy a house in the blue areas, but you were unable to because real estate agents would not sell to you there and the federal government wouldn't give, wouldn't give you a grant anyway. Um, if you look at these, either of these two links here, um, this, this short link, this ATL redlining will give a more interactive version of this map and you can actually zoom in on specific neighborhoods in Atlanta to see how they were um, redlined, um, if they were redlined back in the 20s and 30s. If you look at this um, ATL airport link, um, it will actually let you um, overlay different maps of the current airport in, in Atlanta. And um, before it was built, it was built on top of a redlined black neighborhood um, where they essentially bulldozed the neighborhood and put an airport there because property values were really low. And so city planners figured they could put it there because it wasn't really um, highly productive area of the city, but that was in part because it was redlined for decades and people were unable to buy houses and develop the community. And so um, as a result, it got wiped out and now we have an airport there. 
Um, and so the, the legacies of redlining here have been awful for um, kind of gaining better access to society again. Um, as a result, this has trickled into public policy. Um, in Atlanta in the 1950s and 60s, there were huge battles over zoning. Um, if you look back at these redlining maps, um, lots of black middle class families did kind of gather together and decide to buy houses out in um, more white neighborhoods so they could get better access to schools, better access to jobs and other things. But whenever that happened, it caused something called white flight, where the entire white neighborhood would notice that black residents were moving in. And so they would move and sell the house and sell all their houses. And then the whole neighborhood would become a black neighborhood and then it would become redlined. Um, and again, it's super highly racialized here, this whole process, um, where whole communities were zoned as white communities. There were massive school board fights about um, which schools could be zoned for which. This is back in the days of segregation. They would have massive battles. They would convert some schools if too many black people moved in to um, kind of a white school, abandon it to a, a, a black school. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, the whole city of Atlanta considered um, eliminating um, public schools entirely and moving all schools to private schools so that um, white schools could continue to discriminate. Um, and then the government would have no obligation to teach black students. And so this is all a result of kind of this redlining idea and not being able to get assets to the black community, um, which is bad. Um, at a formal level, um, redlining was banned in the 1960s as part of the Civil Rights Act. Um, but as you read in this article from Reveal, or if you listen to the podcast, um, it's still happening. Um, and so if you look here, if you remember the story here, um, it was the story of a couple um, living in New England. Um, one of them wanted to get a mortgage for the house, but she was black, even though she maintained kind of the budget for a multi-million dollar grant at university. Um, she was only able to get the mortgage by co-signing with her white girlfriend, um, and it worked that way. Um, that is still kind of modern day redlining. It still happens, um, and it's because of this unequal access to institutions. Um, it's been very difficult to make any sort of institutional changes um, because society as a whole is still shaped in a way that disfavors uh, the access of black Americans to um, public goods and to institutions. Um, and often this is because of um, personal preferences. So um, as part of the readings for today, you played this, this experiment here, this polygon, the parable of the polygons. And here, the whole premise of this is that each of these polygons is just a tiny bit racist or a tiny bit shapist. They only want to live, like they want some diversity, um, but they only want to live in a neighborhood of, of surrounding squares that is mostly similar to them, that is up to like 50% similar to them. And if it gets more than 50%, then they move somewhere else. And so that's the premise of this simulation. And so what you found out as you played through the simulation is that you end up almost all the time with maps like this, um, which are highly segregated. Um, and it's not because, and the whole premise of this is it's not because each of these um, yellow triangles and blue squares is like a member of the KKK. It's just personal preferences at a micro level have consequences for all of society as a whole. Um, and so the individual decisions of each shape then lead to these macro trends and lead to segregation. Um, and so we still have this legacy with us today. Um, where even in Atlanta, um, in the suburbs of Atlanta, for example, um, right now I'm up in Gwinnett County and lots of our neighbors um, are moving further and further away from the suburbs and moving to Cumming or Alpharetta or even like Rome, far away, um, because the according to next door conversations, which are terrifying to look at, um, there's fear of Marta expanding and bringing more people from downtown into um, Gwinnett County. Um, there are, there's large numbers of Korean immigrants and Pakistani immigrants and um, Indian immigrants. And so um, there's white flight still continuing today um, throughout all of Atlanta and throughout all of the country um, where downtown um, like downtown communities are kind of like there's fear of them becoming too racialized or too diverse and so people move out. Um, the reverse version of that is gentrification where white families come back into the downtown areas and kick out poorer minorities 
and then um, it starts the process all over again, um, which again, all of this white flight stuff and gentrification favors the people in power and favors the people with money, um, which is not great if you're thinking about um, or trying to provide equal access to um, public goods and to institutions. Um, this goes against that. Um, we still have the same idea with um, segregation in schools. Um, so schools were formally desegregated in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, here you have Ruby Bridges, who is um, escorted to school as part of Arkansas officially segregating or desegregating schools. Um, if you, but like even though that officially happened, um, you can see um, kind of the the legacy of that decision. So Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 uh, formally desegregated all, all public schools in the United States. And so by the 1970s, um, about 40% of black students in the United States attended schools that were at least 50% white. Um, so it shows that there was not perfect integration, but there were lots and lots of black students in fairly white schools. And um, there was kind of a, a greater level of desegregation at that point. Um, but in the decades since the 1970s, it's actually dropped back down to um, the, the same level as like 1960s here. This is in 2011 um, or 2012, this 23%, but it's gotten worse since then. Um, and so we care about this again because of equal access to schools and to schooling. Um, and so we want to, if, if we're interested in, in providing greater access to students, um, regardless of race, this is failing us here, this, this institutional structure that we have. So what are the consequences of all of this? These decades of black Americans being unable to access all of the federal programs that were invented to provide assets to, to families. Um, it, these, these policies like FHA loans and like the Homesteading Act were invented so that a middle class could exist, but only specific types of people in the middle class were able to access that. Um, and so as a result, um, according to this economist here, Sandy Darity, who read several of his things, um, he said that um, the greatest barrier for people of color accumulating wealth isn't their income. It's not um, making sure that um, all communities of color have high incomes. That is great. That's a noble goal. But with, without kind of focusing on the asset side of it, um, the existing bathtub, helping give people bathtubs more than just turning up the shower head. Um, that is the greatest barrier, according to Sandy Darity and gang here. Um, and Mersa Bradaran in one of her pieces here said this here, that there's no amount of lattes and avocado toast that you can forego that will take the place of an FHA mortgage to your grandfather. Um, you see often think pieces about how millennials are awful because we're not buying houses. Um, and in part, we're not buying houses because there's like we've gone through a recession, we're in the middle of another recession, there are no jobs, so duh, we're not buying houses. But also, those who do buy houses often have um, family members who help. You can borrow money from your parents or from relatives for a down payment. Um, and they have that money to give to you because their parents also had money to give to them. Um, because your great grandparents, if you're white, likely got an FHA loan of sorts um, because they had access to those government programs. And so that has kind of trickled down throughout history. And so it's easier for white middle class Americans today to buy houses than any other group because of this institutional legacy of programs designed to boost assets. So. If you want to fix this, there are some policy solutions here um, to make it so that there's better access to public goods and better access to institutions. Um, but the policy solutions are kind of a little bit tricky. Um, because we're in an e econ class, um, our first intuition should be turn to the free market and let capitalism fix it. Um, make it so that black communities can create their own cool businesses and we can, um, they can compete with white companies and then um, let the, the better company win. And then that's how we can, they can essentially pull themselves by, up by their bootstraps. Um, and this is actually a very popular policy proposal um, throughout American history, even up, until, up, up through the Obama administration and the Trump administration. Um, so here, I had you read this article here by Mersa Bradaran. I'm talking about this, this idea of black capitalism and how um, different um, presidential um, administrations have tried to focus on, on improving the plight of black America. 
And um, so as you saw here, there are two competing schools of thought for policy um, supporting black Americans. One um, was to focus on um, the institutional issues, um, which is really interesting. So this is in 1968, this politician here named George Romney, he ran for president. He's Mitt Romney's dad. Um, the, the BYU MPA program um, is named after him. It's the Romney Institute for Public Management. Um, what he ended up calling for was not um, give businesses money so that they can become better businesses, but he called for school integration, for urban integration, for getting rid of white suburbs around black ghettos, um, for essentially trying to fix the, the institutional structures that made it so black communities could not gain access to assets from the government. That was his policy proposal back in 1968. Um, but he did not win the Republican nomination, um, and so he did not become president. Instead, um, so oh, yeah, here's George Romney marching with civil rights activists. He kind of became converted to the cause um, back then, which was really fascinating because he was a white Mormon, and in the 1960s, blacks were not allowed to join the Mormon church, but he kind of fought against that and fought against the church and, and joined up with civil rights leaders, which is totally fascinating. Um, but he did not win. Um, instead, uh, Richard Nixon won and became president. And his whole notion of fixing the, the, the black wealth gap was to essentially point blacks to the free market and wish them luck. Um, to give subsidies to companies, to just let them become capitalists. And if the invisible hand says that they can be good, um, um, if, if they can earn lots of money, then let the invisible hand do it. If they can't, oh well, the invisible hand has spoken. And Nixon's idea here was not unique. Um, every president since Nixon has proposed a very similar idea. Um, Ronald Reagan created this idea called Enterprise Zones, where you would essentially build up businesses in downtown Detroit and in downtown Chicago and New York um, and give them money. Um, and often the, comp the, the organizations that got money were actually white-owned organizations and it led to all sorts of gentrification issues. Um, Bill Clinton had new market tax credits. Uh, Obama created promise zones. And they're all premised on the same idea of just letting um, black businesses or any business in black communities um, just use capitalism to provide public goods and to provide better access to institutions and things like that. Um, but that doesn't really work as we've seen. Um, creating these these enterprise zones or these promise zones um, doesn't fix the asset issue. It might fix the income issue. It might change the speed of the of the shower head, but that's all it's changing. And so, just relying on capitalism and the free market doesn't address the institutional in inequalities and inequities and deficiencies. Because um, if there's no bathtub to hold all of that money you're getting from being in a promise zone, that's not going to help you generations later. Um, and so, there are a couple different schools of thought that I had you read um, for today. Um, some different policy solutions. So, according to Mersa Bararan, she um, is a legal scholar and uh, who used to be at the University of Georgia. She's now somewhere in California. Um, she's moved on to there. Um, but her policy issues here focus on the institutions that block access to assets. Um, and so one of her main ideas is this, this idea of postal banking, converting all of the, the whole U United States Postal Service into a banking system. Um, and the whole purpose of that is to fix the main issue of unbankedness, where there are tons of minorities um, in the United States who do not have bank accounts um, because there are institutional structures that make it really hard to get a bank account. Um, lots of bank accounts re or lots of banks require that you have like a minimum deposit and a minimum amount stored in the bank account um, to have it be free or to have low fees. Um, they limit how much you can pull out of savings often, especially if you have like a money market account. Um, and lots of these are designed to promote asset, um, asset gathering for white Americans, but it makes it really hard for non-white Americans to access the banking system, which then is essentially like taking away the bathtub itself. Um, and so postal banking provides kind of baseline banking services to everybody. Um, and then everybody will have access to a tub and you can do stuff with it. Um, another one of her proposals is to specifically target black banks and help them um, get all sorts of extra capital that they can lend out to black companies 
Um, and the purpose of this, it sounds somewhat similar to Nixon's idea of like this free enterprise zone and, and promoting black capitalism. But the issue there is that um, there's no like institutional guarantees from banks. Um, if you have an enterprise zone, you still have to go to kind of white banks to get the loans for working with um, neighborhoods that are predominantly black and so you'll get worse terms for that. Um, but black banks kind of help provide that those those asset promotion services. Um, and so that's one of her main arguments here is to, to promote kind of loans coming from black banks to black families so that there's a larger pool of assets to work with. Um, this has actually been taken up. So in June 2020, um, Netflix, of all companies, um, in June promised that they would um, provide $100 million in deposits to black banks with the purpose, um, like the, the explicit purpose of this is because a few people in Netflix's board of directors and the executive team read her book about um, the importance of um, black banks and providing stronger assets. And so as a result, kind of corporate America is jumping on this um, and it's hopefully becoming more and more popular. Um, another set of policy solutions you have beyond just capitalism and the free markets comes from this guy here, Sandy Darity, who's an economist at Duke and UNC in North Carolina. Um, and so his his group um, of economists, their whole idea for policies is again focused on this idea of promoting assets, not promoting the, the wealth or the income, promoting wealth, not the income. Um, and so some of his policy proposals that you saw in your readings were this idea of baby bonds, um, where um, black Americans when they're born get kind of a promise of $10,000 as a bond and they can um, turn that in when they turn 18 and do whatever they want with it. Um, and then that's kind of a big nest egg that you can have, that you can start off um, a life as an adult with assets. You can go to college with it. You can use it as a down payment on a house. You can do something with it, but you have assets to begin with, um, which you haven't, which black communities have not been able to have because of institutional um, legacies and history. Um, combined with baby bonds, he also promotes this idea of a federal job guarantee. Um, where when you graduate from college, you're guaranteed some sort of federal job. Um, so not only do you have kind of the bond that you get um, with the bathtub and the assets that you get, but you also have guaranteed income. And as a result, that will help build up your wealth even more. And that kind of promotes all sorts of like anti-poverty growth. Um, it's a fairly clear cut way of, of reducing poverty here. Um, the final thing that he proposes um, that's become even more popular in the past couple of years is this idea of reparations for slavery, um, where he's, he's outlined specific ways of um, specific policy proposals for um, actual financial reparations to the descendants of slaves. Um, initially, when baby bonds, this baby bond idea was created, it was framed as kind of a form of reparations. But in the past few years, um, he and his team have kind of doubled down more on like actual reparations. And the idea here, again, is the transfer of assets to communities of color who have been denied the ability to get more assets, um, unlike white middle class America that has easy public policy access to um, these asset programs. Um, so moral of this story here is if you want to create kind of lasting change and fix poverty and fix ethno fractionalization um, and create better access to um, the public sector and to public goods in general, um, it's best to target assets, not income. Um, not to just like giving people money is important. Um, WIC is incredibly important. Food stamps is incredibly important. Medicaid is incredibly important. Um, but in addition to that, there needs to be there need to be programs that kind of provide this bathtub idea too, that provide that help build up wealth, that help build up assets themselves instead of just increasing the flow of money. Um, and then that has more intergenerational effects, um, which is why um, kind of these economists are focusing on that here. And then finally, um, as we've been talking about all of these these huge institutional problems, um, the the issue here is that. Um, the main underlying issue with, with gaining access to public goods and preventing externalities and, and gaining wealth and assets is institutional legacy. The actual structure of institutions and policies um, prevents certain types of people from accessing public policy. 
um, and accessing public goods. And so if you want to reform um, those, or if you want to fix poverty, you can't just rely on individual actions and people pulling themselves up by their bootstraps and having individual stories of the American dream working out or whatever. Um, you need institutional reform or replacement of institutions in order to guarantee that kind of the overarching structures make it so that people, um, regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity, can access those programs that promote asset growing, that promote wealth rather than income, and promote all sorts of equal access to institutions and equal access to uh, public goods. And so it's a really tricky problem. There are all sorts of very smart people out there figuring out policy solutions for it. Um, it would be great if there was a political will to implement these things. Um, there may be in the future. Um, we'll see. But um, so this is been one application of these economic principles that we've talked about throughout the semester to a really difficult, sticky public policy problem that we have today that is a, a, a very salient, very present issue today.